Alrighty, so this is being recorded now um, and it will be uploaded as a webinar on our website. So if you do have to leave early for any reason, uh, just know that you can still get all the information um, at a later date. Um, so for Autism Society of the Heartland as well, um, we have a 5K fundraiser um, that has been postponed until September. Um, we do have a volleyball tournament coming up in August that we're very excited about. That'll also be a fundraiser. Um, and then I wanted to let you know, we also have another Saturday seminar coming up in August with Kansas City Developmental Therapies, and they will be talking about self-regulation. And I will send out a link to sign up for that as well if you're interested. So those are all of my announcements from Autism Society of the Heartland. Again, thank you for joining us. And I will go ahead and I will mute myself to allow Ms. Leah Holly to start her presentation. Good morning, everybody. I am going to share my screen real quick. Kathleen, it says you've disabled that. So as we're trying to figure this out, could um, everybody type into the chat box, maybe uh, your child's age, or if you're a teacher, what, um, or what brings you to this training this morning? There we go, we're good. Wonderful. All right, are you seeing my screen that's a full screen? Or are you seeing the broken screen? We're seeing it side by side, Leah. Uh, uh, we're seeing yep. your, um, your, gotcha. your screen and then some notes. Notes, yeah, that's what I thought. You know, I've done this about 100 times now and it never fails that when you do that. That's why we got on early, guys. We got on <laughs> early so we could make sure that we did not have any of these. Okay, can you see? Ah. I know. Are you still seeing the other side wanting to split? Yes, we are still seeing it split. All right, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also mention, I didn't say this at, at first, um, but in the chat, I did ask everybody to just sign their name and email as a virtual sign-in sheet um, so that we do know who has attended today versus who just signed up via Eventbrite. Um, so we'd appreciate you also putting that in the chat as well. Thank you. And I'll also include my email from Autism Society if there's anything you need to email me about personally. All right, we're just gonna, you're that still doing the split. Yeah. Oh, nope. are you not doing not the split? split anymore. Nope. So it looks Yay. great. Yay. <laughs> okay. I accomplished something, guys, today. All right. Um, so my name is Leah Holly. I got to get back here to the beginning of this for you. And I did email you a link out this morning that um, is to our a survey basically to get your demographics, your name, and your child's age and disability. We have to have that information for grants. And at the end, when, once you fill that out, you will get a link to the PowerPoint presentation and all of the other resources that I'll be sharing today as well. So um, my name is Leah Holly, and if you have any questions, um, I cannot see the chat box. So uh, Kathleen, if you see it, and we can, we had a small group, so we can most definitely just let our the people on here guide the presentation. So um, as you see the young man there with his, I will leave a legacy. That's my son who is now 28 years old. 
Sean has um, significant autism. When he was two, we were told to put him in an institution, but he'd never talk, never have eye contact, and never be a functioning member of our family. Sean now, well, before COVID, Sean had two jobs, one working at a local apple orchard, and we do live in the metro, um, as well as one working at a nursery. Uh, he was the tree man at the nursery watering flowers and uh, our trees and picking up sticks. Due to COVID, that job has been discontinued at this point. Uh, they've had to let a lot of people off. So, but so my, you know, my history it, with autism runs back with this young man and he has really taught me a lot and I'm hoping I can share some of those skills and some of that information with you as well. I work for Families Together. We are the Kansas Parent Training and Information Center, as well as the Family to Family Health Information Center. Basically what that means is that if you have a kid with a disability or special health care need, birth to 26, from 21 to 26, we're more that information and referral. Our specialty is birth through 21 and helping you navigate education, community resources, and healthcare uh, needs, as well as understanding your um, child's disability. All of our staff are either parents, family members, or um, trained education advocates who support uh, families and youth or children with disabilities. And when I say disabilities, I mean anything from a learning disability, a mental health, ADHD, cerebral palsy, um, a genetic disability, autism. Just, and can, in Kansas, um, if, if I say, in Kansas, the law says exceptionality instead of disability. And that's because we serve um, kids who are gifted under special education as well. So we also assist those families. But I will say giftedness if you have a kid who's only on an IEP for gifted, they would not have transition services as part of their IEP. So just a really quick rundown of what we do as a parent training and information center. You call us and we're going to help you walk through. We'll read the IEP, the behavior intervention plan, help you find resources related to behaviors or community, different community agencies. Uh, we also have a Monday memo. Every two weeks, we send out this really great um, e-newsletter. And I, if I have your email address, I will make sure you're on that list. All of our services are free and there are no waiting lists. So what we do for, if we're looking at transition age, okay, remember we serve birth to 26, but what we're talking about today is just that transition age. Some of the ways we assist is we will provide individual assistance to transition age youth, which is 14 and up. And I'm gonna share some of these different, um, give you a quick overview of these. Uh, our family employment awareness training is, it's a two part training and we have one coming up in Shawnee Mission. The first part is let's get, look at what employment is and not think of getting a job as I have to get ready to work, rather how can my skill, we use my skills to find a job. Like with Sean, we had to get creative and find jobs that met his needs. And I apologize if you hear my Sean in the background singing, I promise he's not, um, what do you call it, uh, hurting, he's just Mr. Sean singing. Um, so, but that we are having one of those come up in uh, Shawnee Mission. The part two, you actually get to meet the people from VR and benefits planning and um, other agency. I will send you the link to the Shawnee Mission and we're just cross your fingers that COVID lets us do this in person. We may have to uh, make, move it until the spring, but hopefully not. We have an IEP mentor project is very new. Um, our staff will provide intensive support, person-centered planning for the parent and the youth. The primary focus of this is transition age youth and 
you know, if you call our office, we're going to provide you with intensive support for any family based on your needs. But we, with the IEP Mentor Project, we're actually able to go to an IEP meeting with, um, with you as well. So if you're interested in that, at the end, you'll get my contact information. We're always looking for families who are interested in um, the Mentor Project. And I, you will have, if once you fill out that survey I emailed to you, you'll have a copy of this PowerPoint that, well, not this one, I'm sorry. I didn't include this on that PowerPoint. Another one of our workshops, and the reason I'm sharing this is because we do have one coming up in November in Kansas City. It should be in Kansas City, Kansas. We're still trying to nail that down. This focuses on, it's a day-long transition workshop that focuses on understanding VR, Centers for Independent Living, accessing supports and services, and making sure that IEP truly reflects what this young, the young adult wants. The cool thing about this training is we, it's parents, youth, and professionals, but we, we let the youth lead it. <clears throat> the youth are the ones who are asking questions. The youth are the ones who are engaged. And um, it's, it's just amazing to watch our young people, no matter what their <clears throat> special need is as far as how much level of support, watch them engage when you put the empower them. We also have an eye transition presentation and notebook. I will go out to schools and work with transition age youth with developmental disabilities and spend that 90 minutes with them and then they get this really cool booklet. All we have to do is get an invite from a teacher and the school and we're happy to come out and do this for your kiddo school. And this is just for the students, their peers and their um, support staff. We have online modules for transition age kids, these are free. You just go in and um, these are the different topics. These are just recently released. Family of family, I kind of told you that we help you navigate the medical side of the disability or healthcare need. We have a caring notebook that we provide free to families. All you have to do is call us and if your kid has, you know, when you say special healthcare need, if your kid takes, goes to multiple doctors or has, takes multiple medications, um, this notebook is vital. For me, honestly, we had one for a while so that I felt a little bit more comfortable with my husband taking Sean to the doctor because I could give that to him and it had all the medications, uh, history, all of that in there. And again, that's free. Parents just have to contact our office. And then we also have a health book for teens. All you have to do is contact our office and we'll send you this really nice booklet. It was um, created in partnership with Amerigroup when Amerigroup was one of the managed care organizations. And this is available in English and Spanish as is the caring notebook. We have a conference coming up on September 12th and Sadly, we are going to move it to um, virtually, so we're learning how to do that as well. And again, if I have your email address, you will get information specifically about this. So transition, let's get into the meat. And if you have any questions about what we do, I'm happy to answer that as well. Transition to adulthood is what we're going to do today is help you understand a little bit better the legal requirements under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, special education law. Um, and understand the importance of student involvement. This is a vital time for our students to be gaining those self-advocacy and um, self-determination skills that they need in order to be successful adults. So we should start earlier, but this is, we can really empower them here. Um, and then how to work as a part of the team that can make this happen. And we're gonna also share some resources to help, especially during this time of COVID. Okay, so what is transition? The law says transition is there to help. It's a process to help you successfully, I'm sorry, my brain. 
uh, successfully move from high school to work, education, or training and adult living. It's a results oriented process and it's on improving the functional and academic achievement of the student. So that's what the law says. If you see down at the bottom that says KSA, that is the Kansas regulation that it is. Um, and this is also from the federal law. Um, Kansas goes beyond federal law when we talk about transition. Federal law says we start, IDEA says we must start transition no later than their 16th birthday. In Kansas, we start at age 14. Okay, so again, pretty much the same thing I just said in the last slide. Age 14 or earlier if needed. The first step, and we're going to talk about each one of these steps because they're very important to developing this IEP. Now think of this transition is not a different doc, a transition once your kid hits that age, it's not a different document. Transition is a service that is added to the IEP. Transition services, the post-secondary goals are what drives that IEP now. So you don't have a new document, you don't have a trans, a lot of people call it a transition IEP, but it's transition services in the IEP. So one thing that changes when we're talking about transition within the, I, the IEP team is that there are two, peop, two new pieces that are required. Students are always invited, should be invited to their IEP meetings. But once you hit transition age, or you, if you're talking about post-secondary goals or transition services, the school has to invite the student. Now the student can say, I don't wanna go. And if the student says, I'm not gonna go, then the school has to make sure that they get the student's input. Now I'm not sure about the level of communication or support needs your kiddos have, but Sean um, has very limited language and him going to the IEP felt like at times it was distracting because I'm trying to help him, but yet focus on the IEP meeting. But we learned over time that even though Sean is setting his head down and it's, he's laying it on the desk, as we're talking and somebody will say, Sean, what do you want to do? And he'll say, McDonald's. And so, you know, is he engaged in this or a meeting? Not to the same level as everyone else, but it does keep the focus of the meeting on the student and the student's needs. It also, even if your student goes for the first five minutes and he's created a PowerPoint or she's created a video or just has a list of things that they want to share with the team, they share that. And then if that's all they feel comfortable doing, then they can leave, but they've at least had their voice as a part of it. So the other piece, the other person that is new to the IEP team when we start talking about transition are individuals from outside agencies who may be paying for or providing transition services. And I'm gonna give you a really good overview of these different agencies and what they might do here in a few minutes. But if the district is inviting someone outside of the school to attend the IEP meeting, you as a parent must provide written consent. If your child is 18 or older and you do not have guardianship, the child or your student, your young adult, must provide written consent. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these as well here in just a minute. So the foundation of the IEP is this age appropriate transition assessment. We do the annual evaluate or the every three years we do our reevaluation and that continues. But when it, before a student reaches 14, the district must do provide an 
age-appropriate transition assessment. So what is an age-appropriate transition assessment? Well, the purpose is to provide information to develop and write practical, achievable, measurable post-secondary goals and to identify any transition services that may be needed. So the first thing is to think of when you're thinking about a transition set assessment, what does the student want to do beyond high school? Where does the student want to live and how? Do they want to live by themselves? Do they want to live with friends? Do they want to live in an apartment or a house? And how does the student want to take part in the community? These are vital questions to ask and have answers to prior to developing that transition IEP or updating the transition IEP. Now, you're gonna get, for some students who are 14, you're gonna get completely different answers by the time they hit 16 or 17. I mean, we all change our minds, changed our minds for the most part on what we wanted to do. But the assessment must also identify the student's strengths, interests, preference, and needs. These must drive the, uh, the planning process. The three core parts that have to be addressed when we're doing this transition assessment are employment, post-secondary education and training, and independent living. Your transition assessment must, by law, address employment skills, post-secondary education and training skills, and when appropriate, independent living skills. Now, if I take my families together hat off and I, we talk about this, I'm going to say every student has a need for independent living skills. Not making your bed or doing the dishes or laundry, but those other skills that we take for granted sometimes. And I'm going to give you some examples here in just a second. So transition assessment, we're going to use that assessment, like I said earlier, to develop the post-secondary goals in employment, education and training, and when appropriate, independent living. Now I keep saying post-secondary goals. I'm going to give you a little bit more information on what that is, but think about that post-secondary goal is what that your student wants to be doing three to five years after high school. You still have annual goals, but your post-secondary goals is what that student wants to be doing three to five years after high school. And this transition IEP, we're pulling together resources and supports and specially designed instruction in order to help that child reach those post-secondary goals uh, in employment, education, training, and independent living when appropriate. It also, the transition assessment's also gonna identify the courses of study, which are those classes that your student is going to take from freshman to senior in order to reach those post-secondary goals. And it has to be updated annually. So as we're talking about the post-secondary, the transition assessment, one of the things that's important is to keep this as per person-centered planning. Kansas is moving towards using life course, the life course framework <clears throat> in order to shift our thinking, especially even in our Medicaid waiver system and some of our other systems, to using these person-centered planning tools and looking and seeing what the student wants to do, what their good life looks like. So um, one of the tools and if you are part of our IEP mentor project and our team is assisting you with person-centered planning, we are gonna sit down and go through this trajectory with you and your youth. And so the trajectory, if you look at it, this arrow says, here I am right here. I'm gonna go down. This is what I don't want. As a youth, I don't want this. This is what I don't want out of life. These are the things that, this is what I want out of life. And so what do we need to do along this continuum to get you to be able to do, help you reach that vision for a good life? So I'm gonna give you ex Sean's example, my guy. Um, we completed one of these and I'd be happy to share ours with you. Um, but 
first off, we looked at what he doesn't want to do. Again, Sean is nonverbal. So we had to step back and look at the people around him as well as those people, um, places and things he loves to do. So what he did not want to do, what he does not want to do uh, is to not be able to ride horses. That's his favorite thing to do. He doesn't want, he does not want to not have friends or be unhealthy and have seizures, sitting at home watching TV. These are things that would not lead to be a good life for him. And so then if you look at what a good life lives looks like, and again, we pulled all those things that Sean loves. So he wants to live in a community with friends on a lake, own a boat and a horse and have great Wi-Fi. So think about those things that your youth really enjoys doing and needs to be able to do. So these are just some of the things that would be if Sean had his good life, the best life he could, this would be a big component for him. And so this is Sean's trajectory. <clears throat> and again, if you'll put in the chat box that you want this, I will be happy to send it to you. But what it did for us is it really helped us sit down and Sean had gotten sick five years ago and had severe seizures. He also gained excessive weight at that time. Those things, if you look at the list, the past life experiences on the bottom left, that gaining weight led to him not being able to ride horses because he was too heavy. So we had to step back and say, okay, what are we gonna do to pull him back up along that positive trajectory? All right, <clears throat> so, when we talk about transition, we're talking about preparing our young person for life after high school. In 2015, KSDE and the board members conducted 20 community visits across the state with parents, educators, and business leaders. During that, they asked them, what are the most successful skills that a 24-year-old Kansan needs to be successfully employed? 81% of those were non-academic skills. So as you're doing this transition assessment, stepping back and looking at these non-academic skills, what are those non-academic skills that my youth needs to be successfully employed? Communication, time management, problem solving, all of these are skills, soft skills that someone needs to be able to be successfully employed. Now, if you look at that, communication could be with um, a device, could be vocal, could be sign language. But when you're looking through that, it doesn't mean your skill, your youth has to be good at all of these, like teamwork. Sean can work somewhat with other people, but he's real. he's better at working when it's just him and one or two people and he is able to work in that type of outside setting so looking at the skills your child needs the top three things that our students need to be successfully employed are communication the ability to communicate and that like i said in any way communicate and the ability to um, follow a schedule. So that could be just naturally being able to follow a schedule or routine, or it could be um, using some kind of schedule or uh, app on a device. And the other is transportation, which is the biggest barrier for employment for most of our youth. But so the non-academic skills are so important. And those, that's where when I said life skills should be taught for everyone, these are real life skills, no matter what my student is gonna be doing after high school, these are skills they need. And on those resources within that I have the link for you, there is a link for um, transition assessments and there's some stuff on um, soft skills and how to parents can help build those skills. Also, but the hard skills are those skills necessary to do a certain job, like a welder. 
These are just really quickly some post-secondary skills that a certain a youth must have in order to be successful in a post-secondary setting. And I put these up here because as you're doing your transition assessment, looking at all of these skills, how organized is my student? How, what kind of things help them be organized? And it's also important to look at your student's decision-making abilities because we're moving towards making decisions, supported decision-making and not, and really helping students make decisions across their lifespan with us supporting them versus telling them what to do. So here's some independent living skills and um, looking at these also and medical, health and medical, these can all be addressed on a goal, an accommodation, a support on an IEP. So making a doctor's appointment could be a goal on the IEP. But we have to do that transition assessment to show this is a need. So making sure that you're assessing as part of that assessment whether this is a need or not. So if you've got a student who struggles with behavior, and behavior can be anything from acting out to shutting down. If that behavior is impeding, just like in, when they're in school, if their behavior is impeding their learning or that of others, the school must do a functional behavioral assessment and come up with a positive behavior support plan in order to address those behaviors. Same thing with transition. When Sean was in school, he was in the community um, probably about three hours a day and he had, um, I got, we had a meeting and I was told that they were gonna have to cut that back because he was escaping. And it was like, wait, he, and they were going to be required to have two adults with him instead of one. Sean was fine with his dad, myself, or his brother, and even his personal care attendant. So I asked for a functional behavioral assessment and I knew exactly what the issue was. Because when Sean, if you park someplace and Sean sees a Coke machine, he's out of the car very quickly unless you talk him down, talk him through the process. And the people who were providing him support, one had just had a hip replacement surgery, surgery and couldn't keep up with him. So we were able to get the right people supporting him and he was back in the community. So if your student is eloping, screaming, off task, then doing a behavior assessment to determine if what supports we can put in place to teach appropriate replacement, socially appropriate replacement behaviors. Post-secondary goals, okay. Um, this is just what the law says. So we've talked about that transition assessment. The transition assessment can be formal or informal. Now, I want you to think about it when you're thinking about this transition assessment. The first transition assessment given to Sean, I went in and sat down with our transition coordinator and she was so excited and she said, he wants to work in the medical field. He wants to um, work outside mowing lawns or um, cooking. And I'm like, okay, can you explain to me how you came about these? She had a set of three, three pictures that she sent, six pictures that she set in front of him and said, Sean, what do you like? What do you want to do? I asked her what date she had done this assessment and she said it was on such and such date. And I said, well, that's because he had a doctor's appointment that morning. He's telling you what happened, not what ha he wants to do. So making sure that that transition assessment is a true reflection of what your students' needs are now, strengths, preference, and what they want to do after high school. They're on our website and on the link I sent you, there are gonna be a list of various transition assessments that, and there are some on there that you as a parent can do even now to help you get a better picture of what your student can and can't do. We ended up using one that was specifically for 
individuals who were um, nonverbal. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but you've got that transition assessment done and you feel comfortable that this is a good picture of who your kiddo is and what they want to do after high school. So now from there, your student has identified what they want to do after high school. And that is going to be the measurable post-secondary goal. They have to have one in training and education, employment, and again, when appropriate, independent living. So what does that look like? Um, okay, that's the same slide. So training and education, what kind of job, what kind of career would your student want after high school? And we're not talking about, you know, I just wanna be next year after I get out of high school, I wanna work at um, a ranch so I can, learn to be a veterinarian. The job that this student is telling us he wants to be a veterinarian. His post-secondary goal would say after high school, Tony wants to be, will work as a veterinarian. The education and training would be after high school, Tony will attend K-State's um, to become a vocation or a veterinarian. So having those post-secondary goals in training and education, employment, and that's competitive integrated employment. It's not sheltered employment. It's, it can be, Sean has support on his job. He needs somebody with him and his personal care attendant is with him to be able to assist him with safety and some of the, the um, communication skills. They, your post-secondary goals have to be observable and measurable, results-oriented, meaning we know what the outcome is going to be. After high school, to, Sean is going to work at a local orchard based on the student's strengths and areas of need. So your annual goal, so once you've created your post-secondary goals, again, transition assessment is first, those post-secondary goals drive the IEP. Now, many times we're gonna have students who are gonna say, I wanna be a gamer, or I wanna be a doctor. And we know cognitively the student does not have the skills needed to go through and be a doctor. But if we really look and do an assessment to try to figure out what is it about being a doctor that this student wants to do, and is there a way that we can get the student involved in that world, medical world? We had a young lady who kept saying she wanted to be a nurse, and finally, once you pull back and you get all the information you needed from her, she actually wanted a job where she could wear scrubs. That was the kind of job she wanted. I had a friend of mine's young, um, her son, who was on the spectrum, wanted to be a professional dirt bike rider. So people are saying, you can't do that. You'll never be that. And so I sat down with him and we visited and it was more of, he, I said, first off, let's just talk about this. Do you have a driver's license, a, a motorcycle license? No. Do you have a bike? No. Do you know where to ride? No, but I want to do this. So we really stepped back and we talked about everything within that world. And then we talked about what his strengths were. His strengths are videotaping. And so we found a place to where they did dirt bike racing. And he went out and videotaped people racing their bikes. People started buying his videos. They also started including him in that whole world of dirt bike racing. So they were showing him how the bikes worked, all of these things. He's now in that world where he is with the, peep the kind of people he wanted with those bikes. And so we did not squash his dream of being a professional dirt bike racer. 
more we just pulled it back and said let's figure out how we can get there get to that point we have a lot of kids who want to be gamers and quite honestly it is a field that is booming and your most of your universities now have gaming clubs and so figuring out is this the job your student wants or is this an a, activity they want to do after high school so we've got the transition assessment we've created our post-secondary goals the next thing is to create the annual goals ieps have always had annual goals but the annual goal now has to tie back into that measurable post-secondary goal so if we said that lisa one of her post-secondary goals was that she was going to utilize public transportation. After high school, Lisa's going to utilize public trans transportation. We've done the assessment and we know that Lisa doesn't understand the safety of not talking to strangers and sitting too close to people on a public transportation. So her annual goal could be that Lisa will learn to, we've got a new word, socially distance on a bus. She will learn to not talk to strangers. And so pulling that annual goal is tied to that post-secondary goal of riding that bus. Annual goals are focused on instruction and services for education, employment, and independent living tied to the post-secondary goals. The only dif the difference between annual goals written prior to a transition IEP is that now these goals must be tied to the post-secondary goals. So when you start adding transition services to an IEP, the annual goals have to tie back into those. Okay, so again, here's just a quick comparison of post-secondary goals versus annual goals. Okay, so we've got our transition assessment done. We've got our post-secondary goals written. We've written annual goals. Now we need to go in and add, see it, are there services that this student needs in order to be able to reach those post-secondary goals. Services that are in addition to what we've he already has on his IEP. And one of those that we've already talked about has to be the course of study. So if you pick up your child's IEP now and it has transition services in it, then it has to have a list of classes that they are taking that are, and they have to be tied towards that post-secondary goal. So what are transition services? They're activities, strategies, and services that are gonna support this, your student in achieving the post-secondary goal. They have to be individualized based on the student's strengths and needs and strengths, preference, and interests. Okay, so it can include instruction related services, and I'm gonna give you an overview of each of these as well. So instruction, these could be some of the things that are on that included in the IEP is um, the, that we're gonna teach them how to apply for and take the ACT. We're going to teach the student how to practice self, learn and practice self-advocacy skills. So these are transition services. Related services are speech, OT, PT, assistive technology. This refers to those that are in place while a student is in school. And then before the student exits school, if they still need these related services, linking the student to this and getting that in place before the student leaves high school. So if you've got a student who uses assistive technology and they're gonna need ongoing support to utilize that or communication, then we need to make sure that we've linked them to that agent or connected them 
with an agency who can provide that after school. So transition services, if you're looking at services and we're talking about employment and education, we can be talking about a student having paid employment during high school or helping the student learn to job seek and keeps keeping their job. Um, also the post-secondary education, helping students learn about ADA and their rights in colleges, exploring adult education, exploring um, what does it take for me to be able to join the military? Can I do that? And what are my next steps as far as what instruction do I need to help me be able to do that? Here's some examples of community experiences. It's important to know when we looked at that definition at the very beginning of the slideshow um, that transition services and that transition is meant to have high expectations that our youth are going to be involved in their community whether it's employment, post-secondary education, or joining a community team or organization, we need to, we're looking at our students in their community and where they will be living. Okay, so here's an example back to Lisa's independent living goal, that examples for um, transition to services for her would be travel instruction, literacy sight words related to identification, and she could take a safety and self-defense course at the YMCA. So not just thinking about, and we're gonna talk about other agencies here in just a second, but not just looking at what's going on in the high school, but what also is in the community that not only people with disabilities access, but people who are age appropriate, any other 16 year old, what are they doing in their community? And is that something that they as an individual want to be able to participate in? Okay, so there's this piece on interagency linkages. Beginning at age 16, the IEP has to include when appropriate, a statement of interagency responsibilities are needed in linkage. So what does that mean? We look at what services, supports, or programs does the, current, the student currently have. For example, specially designed instruction, accommodations, modifications, related services, job coaching, special transportation. Then we step back and say, then based on the student's current needs, what additional supports and services will a student need in order to achieve, achieve that post-secondary goal? And then how do we make those linkages? And that's what we're looking at, interagency linkages. It's not just a connection like voc rehab. And I'm gonna give you some examples. It's not just something like vocational rehabilitation coming in and providing some of the services. It's also, if they're providing, are they going to be paying for some of those services? And this needs to be addressed in the IEP. So some examples of interagency linkages. It could include vocational rehabilitation. The workforce centers. The workforce centers are something we really go over quite a bit more, most of these in our family employment awareness training. But if you have not connected with the workforce center in your community, and there is one in every county, if these workforce centers, students can go in, practice job interviews, learn to write resumes, they'll help them find jobs. Uh, they're invaluable and they're free. And they're for anybody with or without a disability, but they do have a, a requirement under the Workforce Initiative Innovation Opportunity Act, WIOA, to provide services for youth with disabilities. So that's another one of those things to ask your teachers about. Ask your special ed teacher, your, or, you know, call us, call me, and I can help you walk through some of that. But these are some of the people who could be at that IEP meeting. For Sean, we had vocational rehabilitation. 
We had his targeted case manager through the Medicaid waiver. We had through the managed care organization, we had their transition specialist. At one point we had somebody from an outside assistive technology agency who could come in and they work with adults. They could come in and say, okay, these are the things that are available. These are the things that we need to start working on now with this student before they leave high school. The other group that we had involved with Sean was we knew how much he loved horses. We connected with the local um, place where he rides horses and asked if he could do uh, community-based work activities during the school day at, at the ranch. So Sean, with the support of his teacher and his para every morning, would go out and feed and water the horses. And so that became an interagency inter linkage. Looking as a, as a family, this is where we can help build capacity. Who is it that you know in your community that is a part of something that your youth loves to do or is a safe environment for your youth to learn skills. Talk to your teacher, say, hey, I think it's a great idea. Let's connect with the um, local McDonald's or let's connect with uh, any of those places where your youth, if your youth is into music, do they go to a music store a lot? So vocational rehabilitation. Vocational rehabilitation, when a student turns 16, the IEP will determine, team will determine if the student may have a need for VR services. If your student has a disability, has an IEP, has a 504 plan, basically has a disability, they may qualify for vocational rehabilitation services. And vocational rehabilitation services can come in while they're still in high school, when they turn, after they turn 16, and provide a transition or a assistive technology evaluation for employment. They can help pay for post-secondary education after. There's a lot of things that VR can help with. VR has um, really been working hard over the last couple of years to improve their services and supports. And so um, if you look at your student's IEP, we've seen some that are checked that they don't need vocational rehabilitation services. I would, I would question that and ask to see, you know, what is it that VR could provide for my child? Now, the other component from vocational rehabilitation is the pre-employment transition services. If you have a student who is 16 and is in secondary, post-secondary, or other recognized program, they could receive, while they're in school, services from the PRIETS. PRIETS has a PRIETS manager within each region. And that person, some of the things they work on, this is an important tool. This is something that if, it's, if this is not happening, need to make sure you ask why it's not happening. It can happen. These services can be provided during the school day or they can be provided after school. So job exploration and counseling, self-advocacy skills, many of those skills that we talked about earlier, the soft skills, you know, the workplace readiness skills, um, they can also provide work-based learning experiences. pre is it's not new but it's they're really getting out there a lot better and the schools are starting to work better with them if your school says we don't do that then you know you can contact me and i can get in connection with the right people to make sure that you your student if they would benefit from pre ed services are able to access and get those this link down here actually is to um, an overview of the pre-ed services. So as we go back, I said earlier, who attends the IEP meeting? Any of these people that we've linked who are going to be providing services or paying for services while a student is still in high school, 
they need to be at that IEP meeting. And if, you know, the ranch, the people from the ranch were not at the IEP meeting, the teacher and I both talked to them and had ongoing communication with them. But if vocational rehabilitation, the workforce centers, all of these agencies, the, the independent living centers, they can provide these services. If they're gonna provide them as part of the a linkage with the IEP, they, have, they need to be invited to the IEP meeting and you must give written consent. Now, so let's say we have an agency on board and the agency comes up and says, we can't provide this for whatever reason we are unable to provide this service the iep team cannot just say oh well we're just going to take it out of the iep they have to step back as a team and identify alternative strategies to meet the transition objective because it's only in the iep because it was identified as a need in order for the student to reach those post-secondary goals. So we can't say, oh, we don't need it if the agency's not gonna provide it. We have to reconvene the IEP team and identify the strategies to meet the objectives. So for students who have more significant support needs, some may need a functional vocational evaluation. It's information that's gathered through this assessment can be used to refine educational experiences, course of studies, employment activities, information is gathered through situational assessments. For, so for Sean, he was doing some community-based work opportunities at Walgreens. And so they were doing an assessment of his skills at Walgreens. So where the job is performed or where the activity is performed least restrictive environment. So when a kiddo is in school, the least restrictive environment is as close to, is to be educated with non-disabled peers with the use of supplementary aids and services as much as possible, okay? That student is supposed to be educated with peers. So same thing holds true, least restrictive environment. When we're talking about that work-based opportunities. So some of our students are gonna be in that high school all day because they are learning, they need to take these specific classes for, to, in order to go to college or post-secondary education. Some of our students may spend an hour a day. Some may spend half a day in the community and volunteering, doing community-based work opportunities, even doing swimming or other adult activities that they are going to be preparing for after high school. Um, we cannot say a student cannot participate in that activity in their community if we have not provided the supplementary aids and services necessary. We can also, the, where this also comes into play is that many of our districts have 18 to 21 year old programs. Students can receive services through the year they are, their 21st birthday. 18 to 21 programs, some of these are very great and they will meet that child's individual needs. But as an IEP team, we cannot sit there and say that, oh, he qualifies for level one in our 18 to 21 program, which means he can only go out in the community once a week, or we're going to be just doing, uh, working on life skills of washing dishes and laundry and um, counting money and those kind of skills. Individual decision has to be made that that program or those services have to be specifically identified for that individual student. And we, ha we have a, uh, a document on our website that specifically review, 
reviews and talks about the from the Office of Civil Rights 18 to 21 programs and least restrictive environment and the fact that these students are still considered children under the law under IDEA and so they still have the right to access and participate in all the things that any other student in the district participates in. Their IEPs are updated annually. Their goals can be updated. Their post-secondary goals can be updated just like any other IEP team, IEP for a student. So this is a big one for, for families. When your kids hit 18, unless you have guardianship, they make the decisions. But a lot of times that's the first go, oh, my kid's getting ready to hit 18. The teacher or somebody in the community has told me I need to look at guardianship. We are stepping back again, I said this earlier, as a state and looking at how can we provide supported decision-making? How can we support this student, no matter what level of disability they are, they have? Can we help the student provide the support and information they need for them to be able to make an informed decision on their own. Because when we do, when we take guardianship, we are stripping that you know, individual of all of their rights. Uh, we do have guardianship of Sean. Sean's disability is significant enough that he could not make those money skim, making money or budgetary um, decisions. He cannot make medical decisions. We do provide a lot of supported decision-making with him still, talk him through every process, ask him if we can talk to somebody. So, but before you jump to guardianship, step back and we have resources on supported decision-making and there's a lot of grants and things that are coming through the state on training for the supported decision-making and the possibility of um, some stuff going through the legislature on supporting the su supported decision making as well. So let's say you don't have guardianship and this student now becomes basically everything you did on that IEP as a parent, notified of the meetings, evaluations, consent for services, the student is now the person who does that. Summary of performance. All right, so before your student leaves high school, and we have a whole workshop specifically to this, a short 30 minute session, um, a summary of performance has to be developed throughout their last school year. That summary of performance is going to be a summary of academic achievement, functional performance, the post-secondary goals, and any recommendations on how that student is going to the supports they need either on the job or at a post-secondary. When I go to college and I can give them the summary of performance that says, these are the accommodations I need. It doesn't tell the college or the job that these are the accommodations they must provide. It's these are the accommodations that I needed in high school and that I need to benefit from your services. The post-secondary education can take it and say, okay, we've got this, or they can say, okay, we need a little bit more information. But this is vital that it still identifies the student as a person with a disability, because if the student is going to apply for SSI, if they're going to disclose their disability on a job site, this is a quick way to be able to start the conversation about the supports that you need. So if we're going over an umbrella here of what the school's responsibilities are for post -sec for transition, it's post-secondary goals, writing the goals and objectives, getting the students participation, your present levels, all of these things are the school's responsibilities. But as parents, because we're talking about our kids who have some unique needs, we also need to step in and try to help 
build opportunities in our community for our students to have that community-based work experience, a volunteer opportunity. We've got to help build that capacity in our districts. Many districts, you will see that there is a very short list of these community-based opportunities where a student can participate. They're nonprofits, they're churches, they're Walgreens. Um, but looking outside of those and finding those places where your student is successful and it's going to provide your student with opportunities to reach those post-secondary goals, as a parent, we need to start building that capacity and helping our schools do that. Okay, so transition is all about what the student wants to do after high school and how they're gonna reach that post-secondary goals. Um, so I know as we are, um, we're looking right now at, with COVID-19, the uncertainty of will my student return back to in person or will it continue to be virtual? Some of our students have thrived with virtual. Some of our students have not. They're still waiting on guidance from the State Department of Education and each district is going to provide information at, to their family and their students as to how they're going to provide general education services. Know that if there is, if they are providing general education services, they also have to provide the special education services that are in your student's IEP. So that's it on this presentation. If um, you wanna open it up and we can do some questions or. That's, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it just for a minute and I'm going to end our recording.